I'm going to focus on body weight management because um, A, it's on the path to diabetes and there's been so much controversy about whether artificial sweeteners both either hinder or help with body weight management and quite frankly there well, aren't the a lot of studies actually, the um, of looking at artificial sweeteners and the development of diabetes. We'll talk about a couple but um, so I'm going to focus on body weight as sort of a, a mediator if you will and go from there. So first, let's get the disclosures out of the way. There's 12 disclosure slides. Um, <clears throat> actually, there's only three. So um, I have received research funding from the American Beverage Association, and some of the companies that are part of that association are, in fact, sponsors of this meeting. Um, so that's one disclosure. I receive grant support from a number of different companies and or consulting and speaker fees, the usual sorts of things. How have I mitigated this? I don't own a golden retriever. but. I did have a Labrador once, and he was really helpful. Um, <clears throat> so I've noted any studies that are sponsored by industry, and uh, the data that's being presented has been peer reviewed. So the role of non-nutritive sweeteners in body weight management is quite controversial. Um, you've been reading the paper over the past few years, and there have been a number of articles that suggest that, in fact, rather than help with body weight management, these things actually make you gain weight. And if they make you gain weight, then they probably make you predisposed to diabetes as well. So the unfortunate thing is there haven't been any large randomized controlled trials looking at this question in either pre-diabetics or diabetics. Uh, most of the data comes from non-diabetics, and I'll talk mostly about that. I will show you some data about um, associational studies, observational trials, looking at the association between NNS consumption, non nutritive sweeteners consumption, and the development of diabetes. So there have been a number of trials um, that are observational, they're longitudinal cohort studies looking at the association between non nutritive sweetener consumption, largely through beverages, and the development of type 2 diabetes. So this is a recent meta-analysis from last year that Victoria Burley's group in the UK did, um, looking at the studies that were available that were large and had enough power. And so you can see that uh, there were two versions of the nurse's health study in there, the health professional follow-up study, and then the Interact Consortium study was also in that, uh, that meta-analysis. And what they found was a, a small but statistically significant association between non nutritive sweetener consumption and the development of type 2 diabetes. Um, it was significant, um, and the relative risk was uh, 1.13. So not huge, but it was there. Um, as they sort of took apart those studies and looked at all the different factors that could have been responsible, the question comes up about, well, what could explain this association? And it's not just in the Burley paper, but in each of the other individual trials, um, the suggestion that reverse causality could have been involved was made. Uh, that is that, well, what if people who have diabetes are actually more likely to consume these products? And what if the more you weigh, the more of these products you might consume? So whether it be body weight you're looking at or just diabetes in general, it's possible that people who have those maladies are actually looking for ways to control them, and they may be consuming more of these beverages. It's difficult to control for. So there may also be residual confounding. Um, as with any epidemiologic study, you can only gather so much data, and there's so many variables that you might have to control for. So there are probably confounders in there that you weren't able to control for. A number of these studies didn't control for caloric intake. Some of them didn't control for changes in BMI. Some of them didn't control for dieting and other practices that may have affected the outcomes. So it's really hard to make a causality conclusion. In fact, you can't do it from an observational trial. But you can certainly say, well, this deserves further study and randomized controlled studies. Um, finally, it may be causal, but you really can't make that conclusion until you do an RCT or something like that to um, establish the causality. So if we don't have enough studies in diabetes per se, then what else can we learn? Well, we can look at studies in non-diabetics, and we can say what is known about the effects of non nutritive sweeteners on body weight management, because as we said earlier, body weight is on the, it's on the causal path to diabetes, at least for type 2 diabetes. Well, there have been a number of studies. Um, these are longitudinal cohort studies represented here in this meta-analysis that was published last year by Miller and Perez. And uh, the top 
panel is for associations with BMI. The bottom panel is for associations with body weight. And if you look at the top, among those studies, there was a significant correlation between BMI increase and consumption of non-nutritive sweeteners. And the upper quintile in those studies is about one soda per day. And that's important because when we talk about some of the other RCTs, um, that's the level that's being tested, that or above. So, but if you look at body weight in the same group of studies, um, there wasn't a significant correlation. And it was close, but it wasn't significant. So in one case, we have a an effect on BMI, but no effect on body weight. Nonetheless, um, there's an association there that deserves some consideration. So what's going on here? Well, it's pretty much the same two factors that I mentioned earlier. It's possible that it's reverse causality, that the people that are struggling with weight management are drinking more of these beverages in hopes that that's going to help them. Um, and it may have nothing to do with why they're overweight in the first place. Or um, perhaps there's residu residual uh, confounding going on. In fact, one of the authors of this review from uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Mark Pereira, said that <clears throat> there are a number of, uh, if you look at sort of those studies and you sort them into high quality studies where they've adjusted for as many things as you can think of versus the ones that aren't, after the adjustments um, in those high quality studies in his terms, um, there was no significant association with, um, with body weight. So what about randomized controlled trials, the so-called gold standard? There have been a number of randomized controlled trials over the years, starting back in the, in the 80s. Um, the longest and the most extensive of the bunch was actually the first one listed here. George Blackburn did a study published now about uh, 18 years ago or so. Uh, and that was a study that was almost three years in length, um, looking at replacing regular sugar with artificial sweeteners in both food and beverage. And they looked at weight loss and weight maintenance. And they found a significantly improved weight loss among the folks getting the uh, non nutritive sweetener, and they also found better weight maintenance, so that at the end of the three-year period, actually 170 or 180 weeks, they had uh, uh, the people that were getting the sweetener, the artificial sweetener, were doing better in terms of maintaining the weight loss than the people who were not. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other studies of different sizes. Not all of them employed a weight loss program to go along with it. Some of them were just substituting uh, non nutritive beverages for regular beverages or something of that nature. And, um, Basically, at the end of the day, if you add these all up, there is a significant effect on body weight. And basically, it shows that, uh, with the exception of that one trial that uh, Kanders did back in the 1980s, with, in which men uh, gained some weight and the women lost weight, um, all the other studies showed either no effect or a benefit for body weight, meaning they lost some weight. And as I mentioned, not all these trials employed a weight loss regimen to go along with the swapping of one food for the other. So I want to point out one more recent study that is on that list. It was the study done by Tate um, at the University of North Carolina. It was a six-month long trial where they randomized people to receive um, either an attention control, which is just information and do better advice. Um, and these were people that were all drinking regular sweetened beverages. Uh, another group was randomized to receive water. And the last group was randomized to receive non neutrally sweetened beverages. And over the course of six months, the group that was assigned to the diet beverages actually lost more weight uh, compared to control. And water and the other group were not uh, significantly different. So again, this was only, there wasn't a weight loss program involved. It was merely swapping regular beverages for diet beverages or water. And in this case, uh, just that simple substitution over the course of six months led to a, a modest loss in body weight. So with that as the background, we designed a trial that was to look at the question of what happens if you compare water and non nutritively sweetened beverages over a longer period of time, in this case, a one-year randomized intervention study. And so we designed it as an equivalence trial, which means that our hypothesis was that non nutritively sweetened beverages and water would be equivalent treatments when inserted into a weight loss program. So there should be no difference between the two groups if they're equivalent. And we set bounds of equivalence that I'll talk about in a minute. So that if they're not within the bounds of equivalence, then they're not equivalent. And it could be in either direction. So the study's design, it was a, a one-year randomized open-label clinical trial. It was a multi-site trial. We had both the University of Colorado Denver, where I'm located, and Gary Foster's group at the University of, at Temple University in Philadelphia. 
Uh, there were two aspects to the trial, a 12-week weight loss phase and a 40-week follow-up maintenance phase. During the 12-week weight, weight loss phase, as I'll mention, they got specific instruction on diet and physical activity, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, 303 total subjects were recruited across the two sites, roughly 150 at each site. Uh, obese men and women, BMI between 27 and 40, uh, ages between 21 and 65, and they reported consuming beverages at least uh, three times a week, non nutritively sweetened beverages three times a week. This is important. So we picked people who were already used to drinking these beverages, not because we wanted to bias the study one way or the other, but we wanted to make sure that they drink them because a lot of people don't like the taste of non nutritive beverages. Some of them have metallic aftertaste and whatnot. So we wanted people who were used to them and who would accept drinking them over the course of a year. And we randomly assigned them to either water or uh, non nutritively sweetened beverage treatment. The hypothesis that I mentioned was that there should be no difference between water and non-nutritive beverages. Um, neither of them have calories, so it's kind of a simple hypothesis. But we did set equivalence boundaries so that over the first 12 weeks, if the weight loss was between plus or minus 1.7 kilos between the two groups, that would be within the bounds of equivalence and they'd be declared non-equivalent. Um, at one year, the bounds of equivalence were 2.2 kilograms, roughly five pounds or so. So anything outside of that bounds of equivalence, um, then they'd be different and they could be different in either direction. So the intervention itself was uh, a program which we cleverly call the Colorado Way. Notice the spelling. We're, we're sort of like toxicologists. We're not very creative either. <laughs> so it consists of 60-minute group meetings each week for the first 12 weeks. And the folks are instructed. It's largely a fat gram counting program. So it's basically a low-fat, healthy diet. Um, we specifically instruct them to avoid caloric, caloric beverages, whether you're in the water group or the other group. That's part of the plan. You shouldn't be getting all your calories from beverages. Um, after the first 12 weeks, they go into a maintenance program where they meet once a month, and they get follow-up instruction that's really just reinforcing the behaviors and the principles they learned in the first 12 weeks. These sessions are led by either a dietitian or a psychologist. And physical activity, well, they get individual Calorie goals, which is their RMR rounded up to the nearest 100 calories. So if their RMR is 1,250 calories, they get a 1,300 calorie target, which means if they move at all, they're going to be in negative energy balance. And most of them were instructed to move, so everybody lost weight. So the physical activity target was to build up over the course of the first 12 weeks to 60 minutes a day of physical activity. Why that much? Because we know that that's the amount that's required to maintain a weight loss. And so that was simply done. We used the body media armband accelerometers as the mechanism to uh, account for physical activity. And the randomized groups met separately, so the water people all met together and the NNS group people all met together, so we weren't mixing the different treatments. But they all got the exact same instruction. So the treatment groups were to drink either 24 ounces of water a day or 24 ounces of non nutritive sweetened beverages a day. You could drink more water on top of that if you wanted. But that was the dosage. And recall earlier in the observational studies, the upper quintile was about one soda a day. We're asking people to drink now two, two, two sodas a day over the course of a year. The, uh, they were randomly assigned to either of those treatments. And the way they received the beverages was they got coupons from the manufacturers so that they could, for free, get these beverages at their local store. Um, and the people in the water group got bottled water. And the other people could choose from a variety of different uh, diet beverages. So if we look at the people recruited, uh, this is hard to read from the back of the room, but basically the uh, age range, uh, the age average was about 48 years of age. Uh, we had mostly women, as you find in most weight loss studies, about 80% women. Uh, we had a variety of races and ethnicities represented. Uh, the baseline body weights were in the 93 kilogram range. And the, um, they were normal intensive subjects, at least at the beginning of the trial. The first 12 week aspect of the study, which was the weight loss phase. Um, we had pre-specified in the protocol that we were going to publish that data, and we did um, last year in the Obesity Journal. I'll show you those results here in a minute, but um, the, uh, I, I will also present the one-year trial data, which is the, the ensuing 40 weeks. So if we look at the absolute weight loss from baseline to 12 weeks, we see on the left-hand panel uh, the intent to treat analysis, which is we use baseline observation carried forward. Um, there was a difference. Uh, they were not equivalent, let's put it that way. So the difference was outside the 1.7 kilogram bounds of equivalence. So we went ahead and did some uh, comparison testing 
and we found that indeed the uh, Nanninus group lost more weight than the water group. It was about four pounds, a couple of kilos. Um, the same was true if you look at just completers. Those are all the people that completed the, uh, the first 12 weeks, which was 279 out of the 303. And indeed, the, uh, the difference was very similar. It was about two kilograms, about four pounds uh, difference between the, the two groups by the end of the 12 weeks. If we jump to 52 weeks, so this is 40 weeks later, um, we see basically the same, the same effect, um, just the difference gets bigger. So on the left-hand side, we have the intent to treat, baseline observation carried forward. 222 people completed the trial, um, which is shown on the, the right-hand side. And in, I don't know why it says value. There actually is a value that goes in there. And it was, <laughs> it was on the slide when I put it in there. Um, so that's two and a half on the left-hand side. And over here, it's about eight kilos, a little over eight kilos. And it's about uh, 3.4 kilos or 3.5 kilos on the right-hand side for the water treatment group. I don't know why that happened. Nonetheless, similar observation to the 12 weeks. It's just the, the difference got larger um, with time. Now, we were really paranoid about this because we weren't expecting to be, there to be a big difference between the two. We thought they'd be the same. And so we were really careful about the statistics, making sure we hadn't missed something. So we actually did nine different models for looking at the data. And the one that we used um, that was pre-specified is the most conservative of the bunch. So that was the one uh, up, in the, up in the top. The primary analysis was a student's t-test, believe it or not, uh, with all these other d different models sh showing roughly the same effects, which are displayed on the right-hand panel over there. But you can see the dotted lines are the pre-specified zone of equivalence, plus or minus 2.2 kilos. So the two were definitely not equivalent in this trial. Um, in fact, the NNS group seemed to do better for whatever reason. If we look at the time course, this is the data, again, with the intent to treat, um, modeling it over the entire year. You can see the difference in the two groups, uh, water and NNS. So everybody lost weight up to, oh, somewhere in that 18 to 20 week zone, a um, little bit more in the NNS group. And then they started to gain some back, as you'd expect in any weight management study. If you look at the, uh, the parts that are blown up from the first graph, down below, just looking at the regain part of the curve, that's from the lowest point of weight loss to the end of the study, you can see there was still a large difference. And we modeled that and looked at the statistical significance of the rate of weight regain in the, in the cases of both of those. And they were statistically different at all time points. So for whatever reason, the, the NNS group both lost more weight and gained less weight back by the end of the one-year trial. Unfortunately, we don't have longer term data, but uh, nonetheless, they seem to do better over the course of that 52 weeks. So the percent of the participants who lost at least 5% of initial body weight, which is one indication of clinically significant weight loss, you can see a difference here of roughly 18% between the two groups, and that's at one year. And we also looked at a number of metabolic indicators. So um, first off, systolic blood pressure was actually significantly different between the two groups, with the NNS group having a bigger improvement than the water group. Uh, if you look at LDL, both groups went down, but they weren't different between the two groups. Uh, HDL also went up in both groups uh, by about six points in the uh, NNS group and by about three points in the water group, but they were not different. Triglycerides, significantly different uh, between the two, with the NNS group having a bigger improvement than the water group. And for glucose, we saw nothing, similar to some of the data Berna had presented earlier. We didn't see any change in uh, fasting blood glucose over the course of the trial, either at 12 weeks or at one year. So other measurements, waist circumference, as you might expect, it was proportional to the degree of weight loss. So the NNS group lost more than the other group, uh, but they were not different significantly uh, between the water and the NNS group. Physical activity by uh, the armband measurement was increased in both groups by about 34 minutes per day. Uh, but it wasn't different between the groups. And finally, hunger ratings, which we looked at um, periodically throughout the trial. How hungry do you feel over the past week? A scale of one to 100. Uh, there was greater hunger reported by the folks in the water group compared to the NNS group, which didn't see an increase in hunger over the course of the 52 weeks. So the question is, why? And the answer is, I don't know because we don't have sufficient other measures in the study to determine the causality of why people in the NNS group lost more weight. Lots of speculations, though. 
So if we just tick off the possible differences or possible things that could have explained it, um, attrition wasn't different between the groups. Adherence to the study beverage consumption protocol wasn't different between the groups. We had beverage logs that they filled out every week. Uh, attendance at weekly group lead meetings, no difference. Objectively measured total physical activity, no difference. Caffeine intake, there was a small but non-significant difference between the two groups in caffeine intake with the NNS group reporting about and, uh, 208 milligrams per day caffeine consumption versus about 190 in the other group. So the fact that the water folks were, who were drinking diet beverages who were told to stop now had some reduction in their caffeine intake wouldn't have been surprising, but they were making up for it through other beverages in the diet. So at the end of the day, they weren't drinking any different amount of caffeine, which could explain uh, some weight loss through energy expenditure effects, potentially. Questions and limitations? Well, the hunger observation is interesting. Um, we can't do much with that without further follow-up, but clearly the people in the water group were eating more because they gained more weight at the end of the weight loss part of the study. Um, we don't know exactly why. Maybe they were craving some sweet in their diet and they went and ate something sweet that had calories in it. We don't know. Behavioral challenge to give up NNS beverages, that could have been a factor. Just the fact that people in the water group had to give up something they were drinking regularly before um, was a challenge. And that may have contributed to it. Yes, almost. And uh, finally, we can extrapolate it to people that weren't in the study population. So if you're not obese or if you're not uh, dieting or if you're somebody who's uh, naive to diet beverages, uh, we can't ex you know, extend our results to that. So to summarize then, there really aren't any big trials looking at uh, NNS effects on body weight in diabetics or pre-diabetics. Observational trials suggest that there is a slight increased risk uh, with both body weight and BMI. And, uh, but most of the authors of these papers have said it looks like reverse causality could be an explanation or perhaps residual confounding. Previous RCTs don't show a, an effect of NNS to promote weight. If anything, they show an effect to promote weight loss or to at least help manage body weight. Recent RCT data, the ones I just presented, show that they can promote weight loss, these non nutritive sweeteners, with, within the context of a structured weight loss program. So if your intention is to lose weight, these things can potentially be a tool. And I think there's more work needed to separate the physiological from these neurobehavioral effects, and specifically the cognitive effects. So if you know you're drinking a diet beverage and you say, well, I'm gonna take license and now have a Cinnabon, then you probably didn't do yourself any favors. You saved 140 calories over here and you ate 400 calories over there, so those are the kinds of things that we have to be paying attention to in human beings. Um, with that, thank you.